right, everyone, here is lecture 18, which is about our solar system. And here we're going to be talking about a couple of things. We're going to be talking about the inner and outer planets. We're going to be talking about planetoids, moons. Uh, we're also going to be looking at the Oort cloud and the Kuiper belt. Uh, so we're going to start with the components of the solar system and then get into more and more detail um, about these said components. And then we're going to expand off into other solar systems. So questions I want you guys to think about while we're having this lecture is what is a solar system? Like, What is your definition of a solar system? What do you think is different between our solar system and other solar systems? And we're going to have a question similar to this that I'm going to want you to answer. So keep this in mind throughout the lecture so you can come up with an idea. So what makes up our solar system? Um, our uh, solar system, particularly ours, is defined by the sun or any star and bodies that are held in orbit around said star by its gravity. In our solar system, we have the sun and eight planets, asteroids, comets, dwarf planets um, and other objects. Um, and all of these objects in our solar system combined are less than one seventh of the sun's mass. One seventh. There are millions of orbiting bodies with many by our consideration to be big or bigger. And the combined mass of these bodies being so little indicates just how massive the sun is. None of these other bodies emit light. We just see a reflection of the sun's light upon them. Uh, and this is why, for example, the other planets in our solar system wax and wane in our night sky, just like our moon, because they're reflecting the sun's light back at us. We are all a product of the sun's gravity, heat, and light. Um, it's what we see in our solar system. It's the reason that we have Earth. Uh, it's the reason for pretty much everything that we have. Uh, but we will not be studying the sun right now because understanding it comes from understanding other stars in our universe. So we will be primarily focusing on the orbiting bodies in this lecture. Well, what is in our solar system? Well, we have planets, asteroids, dwarf planets, comets, the Kuiper belt, Oort clouds, and satellites, which are our moons. So there are two sets of planets in our solar system, the terrestrial or Earth-like planets and the Jovian or Jupiter-like planets. The terrestrial planets are made up of the four inner planets, which is Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, with the largest being Earth and the second largest being Venus. All of these are rocky planets, meaning that their surface is rocky, like silicate rocks, uh, like ours. Um, there are thin to no atmosphere, um, and they all have relatively low escape velocities. This means it's actually easier to escape from the terrestrial planets, to escape um, from the planet itself in the terms of rockets and satellites than it would be from the outer planets or the Jovian planets. Um, and I know this seems kind of strange because we have had experiences on our planet, especially where we have tried to, um, with the Apollo program, send people to the moon or send people in space and not be able to make escape velocity. So that should have an impact that we have a relatively low escape velocity and we still have trouble with it. So with the Jovian planets or Jupiter-like planets, um, these are known as gas giants for their thick, gaseous atmospheres. Uh, these planets are Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. They have a high escape velocity, meaning that with the current technology we have, we probably would not be able to escape from their surfaces should we send a probe or satellite down. These planets have no distinct surface like the terrestrial planets do. Instead, their atmospheres thicken with depth into the planet until they form a liquid and eventually a solid. Uh, it is believed that their core is probably molten iron rock surrounded by water. However, we will not be able to land anything on these planets with the current technology that we have um, because the pressure is too high for us or a spacecraft to endure. It would sink into the liquid until it got to the soul-crushing pressures of the core. The, planet in, the planets in the outer system are 15 to 320 times more massive than Earth and two to four times its diameter. 
Between the inner and outer planets lies the asteroid belt, what many believe to be the remnants of planetesimals, or baby planets. Uh, the majority of the objects here are asteroids. These are rocky or metallic, or sometimes both, bodies with diameters ranging from meters to kilometers. There are a few companies who have expressed interest in mining these asteroids because of the pure iron that is on them. Some of them even have water ice, which is interesting. Um, if you've ever watched The Expanse, uh, which was originally on Sci-Fi, now it's on Amazon Prime, you can go watch it. Uh, the belters in that show are mining asteroids. Uh, within the belt is the dwarf planet Ceres. It is rounded due to its own gravity being able to pull it in, but it's only about 7% of Earth's diameter, so it is smaller than Mercury. And due to its own gravitational pull, it has formed a spherical shape, earning it the term dwarf planet. It is the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt, um, and other asteroids are a irregular in shape uh, rather than being rounded. Dwarf planets, so I've mentioned these a couple times now. Um, dwarf planets are uh, planet-like bodies that are in our solar system. Uh, the ones that we talk about the most, like the most popular ones that most people should know are Pluto, Eris, Ceres, and Sedna. Pluto, up until 2006, was in fact considered a planet. It was the ninth planet of the solar system. Um, in 2005, astronomers discovered Eris in the Kuiper Belt, um, and it is 25% bigger than Pluto. Previously, we had found Ceres, the largest asteroid, uh, which is smaller than Mercury. Uh, and, and the combination of these two findings made astronomers question what exactly is a planet? Because guess what? There never was a definition made. So they got together um, and they came up with two defining factors of what makes a planet a planet. One, it must be massive enough to form a spherical shape. And two, it must be the dominant mass in its orbit. This means, so here's our sun. If it has an orbit around the sun, there must not be any other material in its orbit, and it must not cross another planet's orbit. Pluto happens to cross into Neptune's orbit, for example. Um, so if only one of these factors is met, say, like number one, then it is considered a dwarf planet, because it has to have the mass to become a spherical shape. So as long as it's spherical, um, it is considered a dwarf planet. Uh, so here we have Pluto and Aries. Um, Aries is 25% bigger, but they both essentially look like small planets. Comets are one of the other plan uh, planetary bodies that we have, um, and they originate in the Oort cloud, which we're going to get to in a second. It is made up of frozen gases, liquid, and rock, and essentially is a dirty snowball. Uh, some make it from the Oort cloud to the inner solar system, and when they get closer to the sun, uh, the gas and frozen gas and liquid will begin to vaporize. Here's our sun. Here's our comet. Um, and what happens here is these frozen gases and liquids that vaporize push out away from the sun. Always, always points away from the sun. Uh, and this creates the famous comet tail that we see in the sky, which we think of like this, right? Um, so the interesting thing about this comet tail um, so this one's going to be gas and liquid that's been vaporized. This one's going to be solids, uh, little particles that get blown off due to solar winds, which is interesting. Um, but the, the more fascinating bit of it is no matter which direction it's going, the tail will always point away. So even when it's moving away from the sun, it appears that it is moving towards the sun because of the tail from our perspective, which is kind of cool. Uh, so it is because of these comets that we have been able to study the Oort cloud in the most detail. Uh, they usually are 50 kilometers or less in diameter. And because of these comets, we thought everything in the Kuiper belt was 50 kilometers or less in diameter. You're probably wondering how we studied these. We actually sent up spacecraft and we sent probes to these. Uh, we had one probe that was intended to just run into the comet and then see what kind of bounce off came, like what kind of particles, were released and how much, and it was pretty cool. The Kuiper Belt is the zone just outside of Neptune's orbit, and here's Neptune. Um, it is two times the distance of Neptune, so it is two times the Neptune's orbit. It is filled with many objects in which we call 
trans-Neptunian objects, or TNOs. Uh, they are mostly composed of ices, and this is where the previously known planet Pluto is located, as well as other dwarf planets such as Sedna. So beyond the Kuiper Belt, beyond the Kuiper Belt, is something called the Oort Cloud. Okay, so the solar system does continue. The Oort Cloud is thought to be a a cloud-like spherical shape that surrounds the solar system. Okay, um, its expected diameter is 200,000 astronomical units. So to give you some perspective, one astronomical unit is equal to 149.6 million kilometers. It is the distance from the middle of the Earth to the middle of the sun. Okay, so that's, that's big. 200,000 AUs is a lot. Most of what is beyond Neptune and Eris, ah, so I was right, um, Eris is located in the Kuiper Belt, Sedna is in the Oort Cloud. So every, but most of what's beyond Neptune and Eris receive very little light, and so it's very hard for us to really study the Oort cloud at the moment. However, new technology is being worked on to expand our ability to see that far, as well as working on sending craft out there to gather info. Uh, but still, most of our data of the region uh, from beyond Neptune comes from comets because they originate in the Oort cloud. Most objects within the Oort cloud would have such a large orbit that we may never see them because they would never enter the inner solar system. So because of this, we aren't exactly sure the percentage of the Oort cloud we've come into contact with to observe. Astronomers theorize that comets that do come to the inner solar system do so because their original orbit has been disturbed by the gravitational influence of another star or have come into contact with another object. The comets we see are small, about 50 kilometers in diameter or less. So originally, astronomers were like, oh, everything out there is that small, 50 kilometer diameter or less. Uh, and then we discovered Sedna, which is almost the same size as Pluto. So Sedna has an elliptical orbit. It takes it 30 times Neptune's distance. Uh, so because of the shape of its orbit, how it ellipses, currently, it is about three times the distance of Neptune, which is just outside the edge of the Kuiper Belt. And so we were actually able to observe it, meaning there may be other objects out there that are that large or even larger. We aren't sure. And a lot of this has to do with maybe there are more planetary bodies or, or uh, dwarf planets or other objects that are out there that have an elliptical orbit similar to Sedna. But because it's so big and so far away, it could take millions of years for them to ever reach us. So in addition to the stuff that orbits the sun, there's also other bodies that orbit planets. Uh, these are called satellites or moons. Uh, our moon is among these satellites. Many of these satellites may be dwarf planets or in some cases planets on their own if they weren't orbiting another body. Some even have atmospheres. They tend to share characteristics with their host body. So for example, our moon is very rocky, our planet is very rocky. So far, astronomers have identified 68 satellites for Jupiter, 61 for Saturn, 27 for Uranus, 13 for Neptune, 1 for Earth, 2 for Mars, 1 for Eris, and 3 for Pluto. All eight planets revolve around the sun in a nearly identical orbital pattern. Here's our sun. They all essentially do this. Um, they are all essentially on the same plane. They all go the same direction, which is a counterclockwise rotation. And at the same time, each planet also rotates counterclockwise except Venus. Venus has a clockwise rotation. It wants to be special. The sun also spins in a counterclockwise rotation. Um, each planet's axis is tilted relative to the orbital plane. Generally, they aren't far from the sun's orientation, and this is part of why the Earth has an axis of 23.5 degrees. The exceptions are Uranus, which is sideways, even though its moon revolves around sideways relative to us, it continues to circle its equator, just as our moon circles our equator. Uh, and Venus is almost 180 degrees flipped upside down. This general consistent orbit and spin and the flat structure of the bodies in our solar system are two of most of the fundamental features of our solar system. Even satellites will generally rotate on an axis and orbit in the counterclockwise direction at their planet's equator, making essentially mini solar systems. With the exception of Triton, Triton goes backwards around Neptune, and astronomers think it's a captured dwarf planet. It is important due to their formation. Oh, sorry, it's an important clue to their formation. So you have 
the whole solar system doing one thing, and all the satellites are mirroring, mirroring that one thing. Uh, what isn't understood, though, is planetary spacing. The inner planets are 0.3 to 0.4 astronomical units apart, but the outer planets are 4 to 11 astronomical units apart. The question is why? Uh, what we do know is that not all planetary configurations are stable. For long periods of time, due to gravitational interactions between them, the solar system could have been formed the way we see it today, or there could have been gradual shifts until it reached a stable set of orbits, meaning planets have comfort zones and they don't like when people intrude on them. So here we can see uh, our orbits going on. We can see that they're roughly all in the same orbital plane, uh, going around the equator of the sun, going in a counterclockwise formation. And we can see how the inner planets are closer to each other and the outer planets are farther from each other, showing how they're at their most comfortable distances, which is probably where their gravitation doesn't impact each other as much as the, especially the Jovian planets, as if they were closer. All right, about the compositions in the solar system. Uh, we know that the sun is 71% hydrogen, 27% helium, 2% oxygen, calcium, iron, uranium, etc., all in vapor form because of spectroscopy. This means that we study the light coming from the sun uh, in order to tell what its properties are. And how this works is it's pretty cool. It gives off a specific pattern that each element gives a certain color. And so we're able to look at that and say, oh, okay, uh, we know that these bars here mean we have hydrogen and helium, etc. The Jovian planets are very similar in composition. Their mass is mostly hydrogen or icy volatiles, and these volatiles are water ice, uh, ammonia ice, and methane ice. The terrestrial planets are, on the other hand, rocky. They are dominated by silicon dioxide, aluminum, magnesium, sodium, iron, or sulfur, iron, and the densities of planets tell us its core properties. All data listed was obtained through spectroscopy. The density of a planet is mass over volume. Okay. Uh, Newton's law of gravitation allows us to determine the mass of a planet from its gravitational attraction to a second body orbiting it, like a satellite or a spacecraft. Volume can be determined using the formula for a sphere. So if we look for volume for Earth, 4 pi r cubed over 3, r is 6.37 times 10 to the 6, mass is 5.97 meters cubed is 1,000 liters. So if we were to try to get density, it would be mass of the planet over volume of the planet, which gives you this which essentially gives you 5.53 kilograms per liter. Okay, and this is what we're gonna use. Uh, so by looking at density, we can compare it with candidate material densities in order to find a likely match. Uh, some elements are more common than others. For example, gold, silver, and lead are very dense, but less common than hydrogen, helium, and silica, uh, which is determined by studying the sun and the earth. Knowing the density of the earth is 5.53 kilograms per liter is between silica rock, which is 0.3, and iron, which is 7.9. So we can infer that the Earth's core is most likely iron, and everything on top is pretty much silica-based. All of the, the Terra planets have an average density very similar to the Earth's, between 3.9 and 5.5. However, the Jovian planets are very much less dense, 0.7 to 1.7 kilograms. This is much more similar to the density of ices. Uh, so there are asteroids which have accumulated data for as well, and they range from 0.2 to 3.5 kilograms per liter. Other solid bodies like Pluto in the outer solar system are 1 to 2 kilograms per liter. And fur further analysis indicates that the Terra planets have a decreased fraction of iron the farther they are from the sun. The outer solar system densities indicate low density material cores. However, scientists have theorized that they have rock and iron cores the size of Earth, which would explain their very large gravitational fields. So now let's get to the origin of the solar system. Existing evidence suggests that the various bodies of our solar system formed at the same time. Geologic features on Earth support this, the sun's brightness. From the sun's brightness, scientists were able to determine the temperature and nuclear fuel consumption um, which indicates a similar age. And then we have radiometric dating, which we learned about in a previous lecture with geochronology. For many heavy elements, all forms are radioactive. For other elements, it's only certain isotopes like uranium-238, potassium-40. The process inside atoms of such elements, like the weak force, caused the atom to split spontaneous into two lower mass atoms. For example, potassium splits into argon and calcium. And so they looked at the half-lives of these particular isotopes, such as here, so in many instances with radiometric dating, 
It dates when the rock became a closed system. So, so for simplicity's sake, it was when it was last molten. So when you have molten rock, like in a volcano, you don't find much calcium, argon, or any other isotopes daughter. Because it's considered an open system, the daughter isotopes can escape readily. This means if the rock is reheated hot enough, like during mountain building, during metamorphosism, or if it's been reheated, um, it can become an open system again, allowing, again, isotopes to escape. Um, and the rock to appear younger than it is. However, using radiometric dating with potassium argon um, and other types like uranium, thorium, marine neurodinium, uranium lead, rubidium strontium, scientists have determined the oldest rock to be about 4.0 billion years on Earth. However, we have individual mineral grains that have been dated up to 4.5 billion years. This means the rock itself may not have cooled enough until 4.0 billion years ago, except there were grains of minerals that did not melt that after they formed. An example of this is actually zircon. So zircon's pretty cool. Uh, once it's formed, it doesn't melt. What happens is it creates layers like this. Um, and you can date the individual layers to see how old, which would be in the center, the actual zircon crystal is. And I believe it was a zircon crystal that they found to be 4.5 billion years old. The oldest rocks that we have been dated were found in Canada, Africa, and Australia. Older samples, have been found on the moon, which is a smaller body, so it cooled quicker. We also know that the moon originated from the Earth, probably from either planetesimal hitting a planetesimal or a asteroid hitting Earth, maybe Earth. But moon samples indicate 4.5 billion years ago, and we have found meteorites indicating an age of 4.5 billion years ago. All of these other sets, not just potassium argon, have similar age ranges. So therefore, scientists are able to safely assume that the solar system most likely formed around 4.5 billion years ago, or 4.6 billion years ago, to be more accurate. Okay. So how did the solar system even begin? Well, the 18th century, Immanuel Kant and Pierre Simon Laplace proposed what we now call the solar nebula theory, where the solar system originated from a rotating disc-shaped cloud or nebula of gas and dust, with uh, the outer part becoming the planets and the innermost part becoming the sun. Modern theory derives from this, but proposed about 4.5 billion years ago, the solar system was born from something called an interstellar cloud. This is a large aggregate of dust, gas, and we can now see are fairly common in our galaxy. So therefore, we can assume all stars form from some sort of interstellar cloud or a nebula, thus implying more stars could have planets or spinning disks of dust and gas which may form planets. The one we have created in our theory would probably be light years across, um, and through spectroscopy of the sun, probably have about 71% hydrogen, 27% helium, and 2% of other elements like silica, oxygen, iron, uranium. Grains would form, and we have found some of these grains on ancient meteorites, including very, very tiny diamonds. So interstellar grains range from large molecules to micrometers or larger. They are thought to be a mix of silica dioxide, iron compounds, carbon compounds, and water ices. We have deduced their presence from spectral lines in starlight passing through interstellar clouds, which show similar compositions to our sun. The other reason we know that these interstellar greens exist is because we have found some on meteorites. Gravitational attraction between matter in the cloud causes it to collapse inward, um, probably due to the collapse of a near depth by star or a collision with another cloud, but we aren't exactly sure what the catalyst was. But either way, there was a catalyst, the cloud collapses inward, and due to this collapse, it begins to rotate, and as it rotates, it forms a disk, which flattening continues as rotation becomes faster due to conservation of angular momentum, um, and so the radius then becomes smaller, it spins faster, it becomes smaller, it spins faster, and after a few million years, it will become a solar nebula, which is assumed to be about 200 astronomical units across. Most of the matter collected in the center would form the sun, and during the collapse, gravitational and en potential energy would become thermal energy, which would make the inner part of this disk hot due to radiation from the young sun and impact from gases falling into the disk, and the outer part's relatively cool as it, was, it would be far from the radiation of the new star and collisions would be slower and weaker. And this is kind of how it's been illustrated is we have these interstellar cloud that begins to collapse inward, uh, eventually forming a disk as it spins. And then as it continuously spins, the radius shrinks and it heats. So as the disk begins to cool, condensation begins. Once it reaches 1400 Kelvin, iron will begin to form. Once the temperature reaches below 1300 Kelvin, silicate grains would begin to form. 
and below 180 Kelvin, you would get water, and below that, you would get methane, ammonia, and would begin to condense. The inner disk, however, wouldn't cool enough for water to form. However, we would have iron and silicates forming greens, and the idea is that Water, methane, and ammonia may have combined with these silicate greens chemically as vapor. In the outer disk, iron and silicates would condense everywhere. Water would only be able to condense where it was cool enough, which is would be past what is known as the frost line, which is about four astronomical units from the sun, which coincidentally enough is about where Jupiter is. Uh, water, ammonia, methane, uh, would be able to condense in the outer. However, in the inner zone, it would remain a vapor. But water ice would be able to begin to form where about where Jupiter is. But methane and ammonia would start condensing past it. As particles condense, they would begin to stick together in a process called accretion, forming bigger and bigger greens and eventually forming clumps. Um, we assume that this is occurring because they would become electrically charged as they collided with each other as gas molecules, basically creating static. The more collisions there were, the more clumps would grow, ranging from millimeters to kilometers, as long as they weren't violent impacts. Uh, larger objects, as they formed, would be called planetesimals, which are essentially baby planets. They are small planet-like bodies. Um, planetesimals near the sun formed primarily from iron and silicates, Further from the sun would incorporate ice and frozen gases, and this led to two types of planetesimals forming, rocky iron and icy rocky iron. Planetesimals beyond the frost line would most likely have grown quicker as they were able to incorporate ices, which would allow them to obtain several times more mass than the silica dioxide and iron could form. When planetesimal reached a certain size, well, when anything really reaches enough great enough size, it will begin to develop a significant gravitational attraction, causing it to bring in more matter more rapidly. This would lead to more planetesimal, planetesimal, and more planetesimal object collisions. Less violent collisions would result in the merging of these objects, and more violent would lead to shattering of the planetesimal. Merging would increase the mass of the planetesimal and therefore the gravitational attraction, which would then draw more into it. And so this eventually caused the clumps to form into rings around the sun, and this would eventually become the orbits that the planets we know today take. Planetary growth would be more rapid in the outer areas of the system due to the abundance of ices. And once a body grew several times the mass of the Earth, it was able to attract and retain gas with its own gravity. So this is how the giant gas giants accrued helium and hydrogen rich atmospheres, since helium and hydrogen are the most abundant materials in a solar nebula. So the impact of impacts, um, basically as planetesimals continued to like have impacts with each other, is that they were heated. Okay, so the impact of impacts is heat. Impact heating is the release of gravitational potential energy. The energy of motion becomes the energy of heat. We also have heat being generated by the many radioactive elements that are present. So as these planetesimals are heated, um, this would melt the young planets, which would allow high-density materials like iron to end up in the core and lighter silicates to rise to the crust in a process called differentiation. Basically, it's chemical differentiation. So think of olive oil and vinegar salad dressing in this instance. Planet building greatly reduced the amount of planetesimals. Um, those that remain are found in the asteroid belt or as TNOs. So why didn't the asteroid belt become a planet? So this is thought to be due to Jupiter's gravity having prevented the formation due to gravitational force. It essentially, every time a planetesimal would get big enough, it would get pulled apart by Jupiter. Um, gas giants would additionally have caused some planetesimals in the outer system to be pushed into the Kuiper belt, becoming things like Sedna and, Ju and uh, um, Eris and Pluto, and in some ways becoming a comet nuclei or towards the sun, where it could either run into the sun and get absorbed by that, or sometimes get thrown out of our solar system entirely. Some of these gas giants would also have attracted these baby planets towards them, forcing them to become their moons. These gas giants would also have been able to attract debris towards them, which would begin to rotate around in a disk and eventually form moons, which is essentially scaled down solar system creation. Um, and you, that's why we see the same regularities as the planets around the sun with many large enough to be planets on their own. Although major planet building occurred rather quote unquote quickly, there was still some bombardment from planetesimals for millions of years, and today it, e it still occurs just on a smaller scale with comets and asteroids. 
Uh, the continued collisions are what led to huge craters we see on many of the inner planets and our moon, and to some extent on the Earth. Although because the Earth is a very active planet, much of it has been eroded away or covered up. Astronomers theorize that the sideways tilt of Uranus has to do with one of these major impacts. Most impacts cause the damage we see due to a lack of atmosphere stopping them, meaning they would have happened early on before Earth's atmosphere was there to stop them. And because most of the Terra planets don't have much of an atmosphere, there's nothing to really burn up these comets and asteroids and meteorites and meteorites that are coming through. The Jovian planets, on the other hand, have very thick atmospheres. And so everything that tries to hit them really just burns up. Um, and it's really cool because they have imagery of meteors impacting going into Jupiter and just burning. And it's super pretty. Um, so unlike the Jovian planets, the inner planets were not massive enough to pull in hydrogen or helium. And the sun's heat also kept it from accruing. And this is why Mercury may never have had an atmosphere. Uh, most of the Terra planets would also have driven off their own atmospheres with the heat that they were creating since they were molten which is why they're deficient in hydrogen and helium compounds. So where did Earth's atmosphere and oceans come from if it wasn't able to accrue hydrogen or helium to form an atmosphere the way the Jovian planets were? We have two theories, two major theories rather. One, that the gas and liquids of the Earth originally were trapped inside solid material. And when it became molten from volcanic activity and from the fact that it was impacting with other planetesimals, uh, this led to its release, forming our atmosphere and oceans. The second theory is that gas and liquid was not actually originally part of Earth, and that it was brought in through the impact of comets. Because comets are frozen ice and gas, the impact would melt ice, vaporize the gas, and when enough, we would have oceans and an atmosphere. Um, a lot of scientists, however, believe it is a combination of the two that there was some gas that was trapped, like hydrogen and helium and oxygen, trapped within the solid material as it formed, and that was released, but it would not have been enough, and so the comets coming in would have given more. Mercury and the moon also don't have atmospheres due to their low mass and low escape velocity, combined with a lack of volcanic activity, meaning that while they don't have enough mass to really hold on to an atmosphere, as that atmosphere escaped, they also do not have the volcanic activity that would allow them to replenish said atmosphere. So any residual gas and dust in our solar system, in addition to if Mercury had anything, would have been driven away, in a sense, by the sun's intense heat, driving flow of tenuous gas outward, uh, pushing it to the fringes of our solar system, kind of like a sun is farting, and it all has to do with these solar winds. Now we're going to get to other planetary systems. So according to the solar nebula theory, we should find dark disks of gas and dust around new stars, kind of like what we see here, and we call them protoplanetary disks. So we have hunted around nebula where we know new stars should form, and we have actually found these thanks to telescopes like the Hubble. So why are we looking? Why, why do we care? We are on the hunt for exoplanets which are planets outside of our star system, or our solar system. But this requires a different approach rather than just looking for these disks. It's very difficult because so, it's so much smaller than their stars, and so they're kind of drowned out by the light of the star. So how do we find them? Uh, well, based on the gravitational force of a star, um, this results in Newton's law of action reaction, meaning the planet will exert a gravitational force on its star, that is equal to that of the star's gravitational force upon it, which inadvertently causes the star to wobble. If this wobble is towards and away from Earth, we can actually detect it using the Doppler shift method, meaning when it comes towards Earth, it will have a blue shift because the light waves will be compressed, and when it moves away, it will have a red shift because the light waves are being stretched. From said shifts occurring over time, scientists can deduce a planet's orbital period, mass, and distance from its star. And we have been able to discover more than 400 planets this way. So we know planet formation isn't rare, but from what we've deduced, much of these planetary systems don't look like ours. In many areas, the masses of the planets are all similar to our Jovian planets and are closer than Mercury is to their stars. It's pretty close. Some have been found to be far enough away from their stars to have liquid water. However, we've found so many, it means that planet formation 
isn't uncommon, especially ones that may have water. But we have a problem. We're not exactly seeing any rocky planets, like ours. Uh, and the reason for this causes a question. Is it rare for rocky planets to form? Or is it more along the lines that we just don't have the technology to see them? Scientists believe it is actually the second reason uh, that we actually just don't have the technology yet to see them, being that we can't really see those other planets anyway. We have to use other methods. But another question gets posed. Why are we finding gas giants so close to their stars? Well, reason for that, planets migrate. Uh, planets can shift location based on their interactions with material in the protoplanetary disk. Gravitational attraction between forming planets and leftover material can cause planets' orbits to shift in or out, basically drawn in the direction of more material to eat. So think Pac-Man. Pac-Man will follow the food, right? He always is going to try to eat all the dots and go after said cherries in order to make the ghosties go away, right? But essentially what Pac-Man goes after is these little dots in the game. And so he will go everywhere for those little dots, right? Now, how could this affect other planets? Well, it could lead to these larger plan planets or planetoids to absorb them. It could also cause their orbits to become erratic and so cause them to crash into the star or be removed from the system entirely. Uh, we see some of these stars have increased iron compared to our own sun. So this may have been the instance in these systems. Also, we have found that stars with higher iron levels are more likely to have planets, whereas exosolar systems may form easier from a cloud with more heavy elements, because we're seeing 25% of stars with more iron than the sun have planets. And we're only seeing 3% of stars with the same iron as our sun have planets. However, again, same concept. We're seeing a lot of Jovian planets with these particular types of suns. We're not noticing rocky planets. Maybe it's that these 3% of stars that have iron levels the same as the sun have more terror planets than Jovian planets, and we just can't see them yet. So we are currently creating new de methods for detection. Um, and the first one is direct imaging, which uses infrared, and it has found 12 exoplanets so far. And this works best from planets that are far from a star. We have the transit method, which um, allows for a planet to be detected as it passes in front of a star, essentially dimming its light. This works better for large planets that are close to the sun. If it's too small, it has too little blockage. Far, its orbit may not line up exactly with us and the star. When a planet crosses in front of a star, we also get the chance to study its atmosphere through spectroscopy. Basically, we have a planet and we have its star behind it, and around the planet is its atmosphere. And so as light travels through it, we can actually see the type of elements it has. So we can tell if something has a breathable atmosphere. Mostly because as the star's light filters through the atmosphere, colors um, or wavelengths of the elements in response will tell us its composition. Um, so we have seen that some are very similar to Jupiter, like HD 209458, and that it has oxygen and water, but was so close to the star that life wouldn't be possible because the atmosphere is like 10,000 Kelvin. Another technique is the gravitational lensing technique. In this case, the exoplanet's gravity would bend the light of a star, making it appear momentarily brighter. Um, and this is because the gravity force becomes a lens to focus the light of a distant star, and then we call it the gravitational lensing method. It has the potential to detect low-mass planets. And a future method that we have in production is the proper motion method. This is a very futuristic method. Um, we are currently working on it. And what it would do is it would look at the sideways shift instead of the forward and away shift of a star. This would be able to detect closer planets to a star and hopefully Earth-like planets. And this would give us a chance to find something that a lot of people have called Goldilocks planets, which are uh, planets that we would be able to potentially expand to and live on in the future or could hold life themselves. So this is lecture 18. Um, if you have any questions, please make sure to post it on the discussion board. And please don't forget to post the questions you have from your study guide here there as well. I hope you enjoyed this lecture and have a good day.